Today we visited Tulo Truck Stop in Kearney, New Jersey. Tulo Truck Stop has been around since 1972. The three generation old business started 85 years ago as TNR Oil, delivering oil and gas to residential houses. Tulo was also the first independent truck stop to have on-site DEF. They serve over 900 fleets DEF through the Northeast region. Dominic Tulo is a third generation entrepreneur. He started out pumping gas for his father's gas station. Now he's helping to grow the family business into an empire. Join us as we explore the Tulo family history and learn how this 85 year old business is still able to thrive today. This is Truck and Hustle. All right, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam, we are back with another amazing episode. We are recording live from Karen, Karen, Kearney, New Jersey. I don't know why I'm putting all the extra stuff on. It's just Kearney, New Jersey. I'm here at Tulo Truck Stop with the man himself, Mr. Dominic Tulo. What's up, sir? What's up, man? Man, it's good to see you, brother. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Man, I, I appreciate the invite. I'm, I'm looking around. I see a lot of trucks. I see a lot of fuel. I see a lot of bridges, cars. I see a lot of activity going on. You're in the on middle of it, man. For sure. For sure. This is a busy place. You guys must be extremely busy all the so time. So busy. I mean, yeah. this is the trucking epicenter. It's busy now, but at four in the morning, it is packed. Mm, got you. So Tulo Truck Stop and TNR Oil, what came first? TNR Oil has been around 85 years. 85 years. Yes. All right. Cool. And Tulo in- Truck Stop mm-hmm. since, I believe, 1972. 1972. Yeah. All right. Cool. So these are two businesses that run in tandem. You guys have some other businesses as well, right? Correct. So we'll get into all that. Um, but I guess let's start with the story, man. First, introduce yourself to the audience. Tell them who you are, your, your title. You're the CEO here at, at Tulo. Sure. Um, just tell them a little bit about yourself. Man. So I'm Dominic Tulo. And at a family operation like this, we don't always have titles as cut and dry as CEO, VP, this or that. And we all do a little bit of everything at a family business. But let's take a step back and go down the history. About 85 years ago, my family started doing ice and coal. This is pre-refrigeration. This is pre-electricity, bringing literal blocks of ice into people's houses every couple days to maintain their refrigeration. And then coal to produce heat. And over time, that obviously evolved. Electrification came around. You know, proper refrigeration came around. And we pivoted into heating oil. SO at the time, which is now we know as ExxonMobil, asked us to sell heating oil on their behalf in Hudson County and you know this part of New Jersey. So that said, we started doing, now what you hear right now is actually the live speaker outside. Okay. Because it's hard to talk to truck drivers when they're, it's very loud out there. So hey, stay on the scale, stay down there. Or, hey, don't park there. So I apologize for any <laughs> no, any okay. loud noises you hear or, or truck horns. It's it's authentic. That's what it sounds like all day. It's this is the real deal. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're really in it. So I, I apologize. But no, all good. Back to the story. After that, we started doing heating oil on behalf of ExxonMobil. At, it was called SO at the time. And delivering dire- like directly to houses. Fast forward a little bit. That's three generations ago. Fast forward to one generation ago, two generations ago. We were doing gasoline directly to Exxon gas stations. At that point, uh, my father was running 20 trucks, doing a million gallons a day of gasoline out of this facility. At the time, Exxon owned all the gas stations and leased them to operators. Now the operators own them, and we now sell them gas directly as a franchise model. Mm. That happened in 2012. Okay. I started here in 2015. We did heating oil until 2015, and one of the first parts, one of the first things I got involved with here was helping my family's operations sell the heating oil business. Natural gas is so popular and prevalent in this part of New Jersey that there's really no reason to sell heating oil like there used to be. So that business went down. We sold it in 2015. It was a great experience. I then had four trucks that had no use. In 2015, it's way different than it is now. They didn't want the trucks. That would never happen today. Trucks are such a hot commodity. I had four trucks with no use and then converted them to a commercial overnight and daytime fueling division. And that's kind of how we got to where we are today. So obviously you come from an entrepreneurial family. You guys are all entrepreneurs, your entire family. What did, was this always your dream to get into the family business? Did you have to get into the family business? What did Dominic want to do? If you asked me when I was 
20 years old, I would have told you I'm never getting into the family <laughs> business until I'm 30. Got I it. wanted to give myself some time to explore different things. And I actually started a real estate SaaS company when I was in college with a buddy. And that was the plan. The plan was to run with that. But that plan changed when I graduated college and my father bought a partner out and there was kind of an opening for me. My dad said, hey, we, we, we need some help. Can you come in? Um, and obviously I, I was thrilled to. I had worked for my dad basically my entire life. I started pumping gas for him at a small gas station in Bergen County when I was 11 years old. So I'd always been around him. I've always been here. I've been here my whole life. So it felt very natural to get involved. So uh, I wouldn't do it any different in hindsight. Got it. So you, you went to college? I did. I went to Quinnipiac University and okay. I studied small business and entrepreneurship. Okay. And you said you wanted to start a real estate SaaS. Well, you started a real estate SaaS company. What was that company? It was called Unify, shoot, Unified Solutions. Okay. Um, and we had you do two there? paying customers and we basically built a program where uh, you could send maintenance requests into your landlord to fix something. That's dope. Yeah, it was pretty cool. But I learned pretty quickly. Uh, everybody wanted something different. There was really no cookie cutter software I could sell to a million people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be in the custom software business. Got it. So your customer was going to be like, uh, like people renters? Uh, the customer would have actually been building owners and the users would have been people living in the buildings. Got it. To report, you know, issues, leaks to, you know, the building maintenance. Got it. I mean, it sounds like a great idea. So what'd yeah. you do with that business? I mean, did it just like not take off and what, what happened with it? We had one paying customer. Um, we almost had a second one. The second one wanted something custom. And then we ended up just offloading the paying customer to a, a more scalable solution and that we pretty much dissolved, dissolved the company. It. Yeah, but okay. it was a great experience through and through. Okay, got it. So after that, you said the opening happened and your father was like, hey, man, we, we, we need some help. Yeah, the opening happened. And, you know, when you join a family business like that, there's no playbook, right? There's no job title. There's no, hey, come in. This is what you do. And here's who exactly you're going to learn from. It's just not that cut and dry in a family operation. So started here in May 2015 and just wanted to find my way. I've always liked sales. I've always liked calling people and just kind of asking for their business. So when I first started here, it's kind of like that Wolf of Wall Street moment <laughs> where Jordan's on, you know, making a cold call and everyone's kind of looking at him like, yo, no one's ever really done that. How'd you just do that? Right. And I just sat down and I called, you know, one of the larger companies that I, I saw come through here, but I knew we didn't have all their business, found them on Google, found their number, called, asked for the purchasing agent, got a hold of them and was able to like do a deal pretty quickly. And my dad looked over at me like, whoa, <laughs> we got a star here. Yeah. So I kind of just leaned into that and started selling fuel outside to like national fleets over the phone. And just that, that was kind of my first, my first touch here in 2015. Got it. So did you get your sales experience from the SaaS business? Is that where you kind of got those thousand reps in or whatever, just calling, calling, getting all those no's? I did. And, and my buddy and I, um, you know, you're always nervous when you start. So my buddy, Nick Hakeem, uh, and I, he, he put his phone down. I put my phone down and he would dial a number for me and he would just hit go. And then I would hit go. And <laughs> so we didn't give each other a choice. Like you, you needed to just, you were on, like you were just on. Yeah. Yeah. And prior to that, you said nobody was really doing that in the, in the business in terms of like the outbound reach. Yeah. And you know, for like no particular reason, no one had just really thought to. Right. It was kind of like whatever was coming, whoever your customers were, were who your customers were. Yeah. And my father is like super, super hands on, still is to this day, like likes to maintain trucks, likes to get really involved in like the real nitty gritty of the operation. Yeah. So just no one had really spent the time to kind of like step back and say, how do we, how do we scale this company um, in a way where I don't have to go knock on every single door? And the cold call for me just seemed like the most natural way. For sure. For sure. All right. Cool. So when you join, join the family business officially, tell me about the businesses underneath the umbrella. What are you guys doing? Sure. Um, at the time, and we still do, it's just changed slightly, but it's, it's still really similar to what it was in 2015. We had the heating oil business uh, that was being sold as I joined. Um, TNR Oil Company is a commercial wholesale business. So we sell fuel, diesel fuel, we sell gasoline to gas stations that we don't operate. We sell motor oil uh, and we sell diesel exhaust fluid. I want to bookmark DEF. We'll come back to that. Okay. Okay. Um, we also run this truck stop outside, which is the Tulo truck stop. Uh, it's a high volume, nine fuel lane truck stop that has diesel exhaust fluid below ground. One of the first independent sites to have that. We do truck parking behind me. And then behind that, you see some more truck parking. We do that as well. We've done that for, ooh, 
I don't know, since we bought this land in, I guess, the 70s. Um, and then in 2001, we bought a truck stop a quarter mile down the street, which is the New Jersey truck stop, which is a mobile. Um, and then that's got parking around it as well. So truck stops, gas stations, wholesale. Uh, we, do, we, we did operate a couple of gas stations. We no longer do. But now we really just focus on commercial fuels. Got it. Because you mentioned that you said you were pumping gas for your dad when you were 11 years old, right? Yeah. So my mom and dad operate a separate gas station, which is separate from this umbrella uh, in the small town that we grew up in, that I grew up in. Um, And it was just an amazing experience. I've always, I always wanted to work there as a kid. The day before Thanksgiving, when I was 11 years old, he finally let me because they were super busy. Um, And that's just an amazing experience, man. Like, basically handed me a wad of cash and just like <laughs> learning how to count cash like you'd be surprised man kids can't do that anymore yeah and like t- talking to 100 adults a day just just made me made me who i am yeah yeah for sure for sure making sure that your compliance is on point is an integral part of any trucking related business today i stopped by my friends over at fleet drive 360 to talk about what they're building to make sure that you can run a successful trucking company and it's everything from the minute you decide you want to hire somebody through maintaining all of your FMCSA compliance documents for ongoing fleet or, or owner operator truck uh, business. You've got a driver hiring and recruiting module where you'll create driver qualification files, import digital documents. You've got a drug and alcohol module where you can schedule pre-employment drug tests and manage an ongoing testing pool. We've got an accident registry so you can keep your mandated accident logs and even schedule follow-up uh, drug testing for post-crash. We've got vehicle maintenance logs so you can not only maintain the compliance status of your vehicles but also upload your work work orders and compliance related documents so you're audit ready when they come in. We've got a document repository, fancy words for digital cloud storage of any document that you want, not just necessarily the compliance documents, anything related to your business, post crash videos, performance evaluations. And then finally, you've got the dashboard and the dashboard's the most important part. You can close your eyes and glance at our dashboard, open them, glance at the dashboard and immediately know whether or not you're compliant or not, both on a driver, company and vehicle level. It's one stop shop for all your compliance needs. All right, cool. So you get in and you start you start out with the fleet sales. So um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. So this is like local accounts. um, You're calling them and you want to do like on site fueling. Yeah. Right. So I've done both. Okay. I've sold national fuel. So like at this truck stop, if I'm doing a deal with somebody, they're usually going to be a national over the road fleet. So when their drivers come through, they look at their app and they see, oh, I have a preferred fuel deal at the too low truck stop. Those drivers are incentivized on their bonuses, like the Schneiders, the NFIs. They're incentivized based on their quarterly bonus to fuel at a preferred fueling location. So it was my job to basically get us on that preferred list. So mm-hmm. I've sold to national fuels. That's got a way different feel than selling to a local fleet. On a local fleet, I actually found that if you went onto the DOT website and just looked up a local fleet's name, that a small local fleet, odds are the fleet owner's cell phone number was a registered (laughs) number. For sure. Right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could just text him and call him directly. He or she called him directly and just say, hey, I sell fuel, I sell DEF in your area. Can, Can we talk? So that's a different sell. It's a more quick and dirty Whereas calling the national fleet is like, you really got to be methodical about how you get through the gatekeeper to get the procurement department and get her name and figure out her, his name and get the rates. Whereas selling to a local guy, which I do today, is just way more quick and dirty. Got it. So like you said, you have to get, you have to become more like a preferred, a preferred, I said perverted, per- preferred, <laughs> a, a preferred vendor, yeah. right? You have to get on like, like you got to sign like an RFP and all that kind exactly. of stuff, become a preferred vendor and uh, you get on the list. So typically how many preferred vendors do these like big, large national um, the companies have? Like to they could have hundreds. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. But that said, like pilot is a single signature or loves or TA, they get single signature coverage nationwide of preferred places. And then they'll sprinkle in a couple independents like me. Back in 2015, the nearest pilot was like 80 miles away. So I had kind of an edge. Okay. Okay. Got it. And you said you wanted to bookmark DEF. Um, so talk about that. Yeah. Diesel exhaust fluid was a really interesting thing for us. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, diesel exhaust fluids, 32.5% urea, and the remaining is deionized water. And when you mix it into the catalytic converter or past the catalytic converter, it makes truck emissions burn 
virtually emissionless. Now we could talk more about that, but not really. <laughs> People have their own this own kind of interpretation of emissionless, but. It was federally mandated in 2011, and every, any diesel burning truck after 2011 had to have diesel exhaust fluid. Well, Hurricane Sandy happened here in 2012, so we had the fleets in the port by us basically wiped out. And Chris Christie, the governor at the time, issued a $30,000 rebate to go replenish your fleet if your truck got wiped out. So we had basically a new generation of diesel exhaust fluid burning trucks in this general vicinity really quickly. Mm. So we jumped on it. We put diesel exhaust fluid below ground. My uncle had the foresight and said, we're putting DEF at this truck stop. Oh, and wow. we were the first independent to do it. Then we bought a tanker truck to begin delivering it to ourselves. You need a stainless steel tanker truck to deliver the stuff because it's corrosive. It's not hazardous, but it's corrosive. So we had the equipment really before anybody else. Some of these trucks are diesel. Some have diesel exhaust fluid in them. Uh, let's see, what number is this? This is 24, this has got DEF in it. Okay. So it's actually a stainless steel tank, okay. but it's designed to look like a fuel truck. And that's just so anybody can jump on it and they know exactly how to use it. Uh, but it's also the most efficient way to deliver because you can pull the hose out of either side. So when you get to a job, if the tank's on this side or that side, it's really easy and straightforward. Got it. The truck was not that busy. We only had to deliver to ourselves maybe once or twice a week. So I began putting out these 330-gallon totes to folks like JG Cruz, Aria Logistics, and giving them DEF at their facilities so they could fill their, t their trucks on site. So we were putting these 330-gallon tanks all over the state, and um, that was all all done over the cold call and the cold text and just saying, hey, we'll put DEF at your facility and people jumped all over it. Yeah, that's crazy. I remember when that happened, when kind of DEF kind of exploded on the scene and it hasn't gone, it hasn't changed since. No, <laughs> it's not, no, going, it's not going away. So you said you guys were the first in like the country to do that? Or? No, I would say we were first in this market to do it, but this market had such a head start because, because of, of Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy. Sandy. Now that said, I already had the infrastructure. I had the billing infrastructure. I had the trucking wherewithal. I had the lineage. I had my father, my cousin, and my uncle saying, hey, this is what you need to do. This is the playbook. Because we used to do heating oil, which is filling of 300 to 500 gallon tanks. So the playbook's basically the same. The product is just different. Yeah. And I asked them, I said, if you could do anything different today, knowing what you know to fill small tanks, what would you do? And my cousin Alex said, oh, you need to put cellular telemetry on every tank. What's that? It basically is a remote tank gauge. Okay. So we could see the exact volume on all of our customers' tanks. Mm. So when I go out, I know exactly how Where much we're going to fill. Yeah. And uh, that allows me to go down to Delaware and daisy chain a route together and fill up all these tanks on the way down. So yes, we were first, but I honestly do believe we do it the best because of that. So I can price aggressively because I deliver more efficiently. So I had the garage, I had the ability to make all the totes. We had a couple guys who were just pros at making the equipment. I sourced all the parts out. So I really just, yeah, we weren't the first, but I really do believe we do it the best. Got it. Got it. Okay. So with the, I mean, cause there's so much that you guys do. I just want to kind of break them down. One it's by so one. much. <laughs> yeah. Right. All right. So let, let's start with um, some of the local accounts here. How many local accounts do you guys uh, service? Sure. For diesel fuel, not many. That's a very localized business, maybe 50 fleets that we service with local diesel fuel. Whereas okay. with the diesel exhaust fluid, we service about 900 fleets. Um, that's all of New Jersey. That's Southern Connecticut, Northern Delaware, Eastern Pennsylvania, and then south of Albany in New York is where we travel on that. How much staff does it take to do that? Uh, I'm proud to say that my brother's back end infrastructure is so good that my office still has the same three people it did from 2015. Wow. So the office staff is the same. My brother builds, my brother Alex builds super, super kick-ass scalable the, the solutions. Routes. So, so yeah. is that a matter of the, the route set, you're, like the route optimization to be able to do that? How are you able to do, service so many places with so many, with so little people? That cellular telemetry 
allows us to basically maximize our route. So I should just kind of clarify the three people clerical and the staff in our office is the same as it was in 2015. Got it. Got it. Now we've added more trucks, but what, what I can do with three trucks, I think it takes my competitors five or six to do mm. because of that cellular telemetry. You see for us, if we have a customer, customers don't call us, we go to them. So right. if I have a customer who needs DEF in, let's say Delaware, I'm going to build a route down Route 95 that's going to be super efficient where we're jumping off and filling a, you know, we're leaving Kearney, New Jersey. We're stopping in Robbinsville. Then we're stopping in Pedrickstown, New Jersey. And then maybe we're stopping down by you in Cinnamonson. And then we're going down into Delaware. So my route is just so efficient. Whereas my competition, they do what's called a Julian calendar. So they'll estimate what that guy used in Delaware and then they'll keep estimating. But that doesn't take account if he gets more trucks. It doesn't take account if uh, the weather changes and they run harder. It doesn't take account if they get busier. It doesn't take account if they got slower. So my competition will not really be able to, in real time, adjust the way we can when it comes time to deliver. Got it. So we're just more efficient. So you guys have that competitive moat. Why does anybody take that idea? I have no idea. Do it? <laughs> I have no idea. I'm here on a podcast talking about it, and I've been vocal about it for five or six years, man. Right. I, I, I don't know. And now, this is nothing that's proprietary, do. right? So It's expensive to do. Um, I think if you didn't build your own equipment like we do, like we, I source the totes, I source the pumps, I source the hoses. Uh, we, we drill our own holes in the tank to put these telemetry gauges in. I just think if you don't do all of those individual things, it becomes harder. And it becomes more expensive. Like if I need to pay someone to do all those things, it, it would be really, really costly. But we just do it all here because I have the facility. Yeah. But I don't know. The answer to your question, I don't know. I mean, it, it, and that's probably exactly what it is. It Probably the other companies, they've been doing things the same way for however long. And they don't have the infrastructure to build it and to make it happen for it to make sense for them. You Penny know? wise, pound foolish. Yeah, exactly. 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 Okay, cool. Um, national accounts. You said about how many national accounts you guys have? Not a ton. Maybe maybe a dozen. Okay. Um, but for, for what's run- the sales cycle on those? Yeah, I mean, for running an independent truck stop, having a dozen is really great because it brings in a different customer class than what we're used to. At this truck stop, it's mostly port drayage, so we don't get a ton of over the road. It's mostly independent port drayage. So for us, those over the road guys bring in business at three p.m when otherwise this place is not that busy. Now, we're, I said earlier, we're super busy at four in the morning because that's Port Drayage guys looking to get out before there's traffic. The sales cycle on those is relatively long. It could take six months to a year to get someone to sign up for a deal. But once you do, then you're pretty much set it and forget it. As long as you see that their volume is consistent, you can kind of go hands off. Uh, that said, they may come back to you and say, hey, if you want the volume that you're used to having, you have to give us a better deal because so-and-so just gave us a better deal, and now you're not the most preferred fueling mm-hmm. solution. So Got it just it. depends. And what kind of savings are you guys able to offer? The uh- Oh, my God, man. National, national fuel buyers get the best rates. I mean, you're talking really, really lean, cost-plus deals to get them in here. I mean, sometimes we literally walk away from a national deal after having it for a few years because you're losing. we're losing money. Yeah, so, I mean, they can get insane deals. But How, how do you price those? Uh, you pretty much have to ask them where you got to be. They have all the purchasing power. They got buy it. more diesel than I do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. So what what makes outside of just price? What are the other things that they're looking for in order to you know make you a preferred vendor? Not much. Just price. I mean, it's nice that we have the showers. It's nice that we have the DEF in tank below ground. It's nice that we have a store, but not much. It's, it's all, all price. It's all bottom line. All price. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, let's move forward. So you also do um, the, tr- the, the the truck parking mm-hmm. as well. How big of the part of the business is that? It used to be a smaller part of the business, but just what's happened around here and the recent e-commerce boom through COVID has made truck parking just an incredible, incredible commodity. As we walk, we're walking through the truck stop. These like trucks like this park overnight for like an hourly rate. We have trucks all around that park. Um, just want to make sure that no cars come through. It's it's pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. And then we have the cat scale. So over the road guys. Or How much do one guys. of those things cost to purchase, man? One of those scales. So cat scale actually owns this one. Okay. So when you when cats in, it's like a franchise. They own it. Um, they leave it here. They maintain it. Uh, I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Do you make any money off of it? Yeah, we make like, like, like you're, yeah, you're renting like, it. Like yeah, they like give a... us like half of it. Okay. Um, it's a split. So the street cleaner comes in handy. 
we have full-time janitorial staff okay cleaning up garbage cleaning up the bathrooms um it's it's a lot but you, you need it That's especially it. at a high traffic facility like this and back there you guys can see is a truck parking yeah, so that's the overnight truck parking. So you got about, how many trucks to fit back there? Back there, probably 30. 30? Yeah. And you have another space somewhere else, right? All around this. All, all around, okay. All around. And then there's another property uh, about a quarter mile up the road, which is similar size and property around that as well. And that's just truck parking, right? No, there's a truck stop there too. Oh, the stop there as well? Yeah, there's a okay. truck stop there too. Uh, I think what's important to understand about truck parking is it's really difficult to make more of it. So if you owned an apartment building and it was really large and next to it had an empty lot and you said, hey, Carney, I'd like to buy this apartment building and knock it down and put truck parking here, they would laugh at you. They would say, absolutely no way are we going to let you zone this for truck parking. And because of that, truck parking is so scarce. You can't make more of it. We have truck parking here and we have, very, we have what's called low coverage. So we don't have a lot of building uh, buildings on this truck parking. When I started in 2015, the truck parking business was nascent and uh, not really institutionalized whatsoever. That's changed dramatically in the last eight or nine years. Now you have institutions like Brookfield and Real Term and really large institutional players coming in and swallowing up what the new kids call iOS. <laughs> to me, iOS was always like an iPhone, right? right. But they call it industrial outdoor storage, so... Yeah, I'm happy to say we're in the industrial outdoor storage business. Um, it's, it's probably the most important part of what we do today. Why would you say that? I just think there's the most future in it. And no matter if, no matter if we're selling you diesel fuel or if one day we're selling you hydrogen or natural gas or electricity, you need the space to do it. And we have that low coverage space to do it. Mm, got it. How many, how many trucks could you fit in your lot? Uh, we operate down here. Uh, we have several tenants. Um, we could probably park anywhere from five to 600 trucks across what we have. Got it. Got it. And most of your guys, I'm sure like have like long-term accounts. It's all, monthly. yeah, it's mostly long-term. Some people lease directly to independent owner operators. We do not do that. We will lease directly to a larger trucking fleet and then they may sublease it to their owner operators as part of their gig of hey, if you move our freight, we can give you a parking spot and here's where it is and it's in South Kearney. But we only lease directly to, we do master leasing. Okay, got it. And is there a discount for like the long-term parking or? Um, it's a good question um, and, and it's always changing. So the answer is no, there, okay. there is no discount for longer-term parking. It's actually more expensive the longer-term lease you want. Got it. Um, just just the, with the nature of how scarce this asset is and how many institutions are all over it, if you want a long-term lease, we may ask you for a 15 or 20% year-over-year increase. Got it. Where, which just sounds the, insane, the, right? Well, the actual space, the, the value of that space goes up. Correct. As the years progress, right? Like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and with just the recent uh, just inflation and, and just how hot assets have gotten, I know a lot of assets have cooled off, but industrial has not had the same corrective effects as a lot of other stuff. Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay. And then I also saw you have tire service out there. We do. We don't operate that. That's leased out to a third party. Uh, most of the most of the tenants in this building are, are leased out. So the subway be uh, below us, there's a Spanish restaurant called Mana below us, who's been with us for quite some time. Those are all third party operators. Um, we also have a DOT physical doctor on site. Uh, we have someone who does accounting and truck insurance on site, but that's all leased out. We operate the store, the truck parking behind us and the fuel. Got it. So I didn't realize you guys owned the whole building. Correct. Okay. Okay. Got it. We got gasoline at the end. These are all diesel only right mm. here. And that's not self, that's self-service. The diesel's all self-service. Oh, so self-serve. Okay. Yeah. The diesel self-serve. The gas is not. New Jersey, we're not allowed to do self-serve gas, but we can do self-serve diesel. Got it. Got yeah. it. And this is the real estate. That's what we talk about in terms of yeah. having. Yes. Yeah, so you got the man of Spanish food. Yeah. David's been there a long time people rave about it the subway you gotta have the subway you gotta have that national brand For and then sure. we've got the store the coffee the cigarettes um, the number one sale I actually don't know if it's still number one but for a while one of the number one sales was actually buttered roll at this truck stop <laughs> for whatever reason buttered roll super popular okay um, behind that you know your cigarettes are all, all always popular 
Okay. Probably not as popular as they used to be. A lot, a lot of folks don't smoke like they used to, but. Roundabouts, what can you get for these for these units? Um, probably about like 1,500 for like 600 square feet. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty small, um, but so what is it like? Busy. What is that, like $19 square feet? How much is that? that I've never done the math that way. No, man. Yeah, I'm an acreage guy. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. You think bigger than I do. <laughs> <laughs> we are here live at OTR Solutions HQ. I'm here with my partner, Jonathan. Man, listen, factoring is an integral part of the transportation industry. Why is factoring important? Absolutely, Ramel. In this economy, in this market, cash flow is king. Cash flow is the key to growth. If you have a young trucking company or if you've been in the industry for years and you want to take that business to the next level, we're absolutely a company that can help. So I hope you'll give us a call today. Let us know what we can do to help you out. Get the rest and roll with the best. Let's go. Okay, cool. What is um, your day-to-day -day look like? It's always different. Talk Sometimes. To me, talk to me about like today. What, what, what is, well, not today, yesterday, because you're here with me today, right? Sure. So what did, what did Monday look like for you? I did some money collection yesterday. Um, just kind of looked at, you know, what we need to do to make sure our account receivables are proper. Uh, I was at F3 last week. Okay. So I was kind of settling in, getting everything back together. Um, kind of, you know, checking my limbs, make sure nothing's broken, <laughs> right? Because I was away for, for a couple of days. Um, yeah. But right now in this cycle of the market, account receivables is really important. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of pain in the market. There's a lot of people who can't pay on time. So we're really, really keen on our account receivables right now. So I spent a good deal of time on that yesterday, talking to customers, getting an idea of where they are with, with paying us, um, checking emails. Uh, yeah. Basically, that's it. How lenient are you on account receivables? How, how, how long do you give people an opportunity to pay? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. <laughs> and I mean, we're talking about different businesses as well, too, right? Mm -hmm. Fuel, like what's the what's the term on, on fuel and different things like that? Explain that to me. I like to get paid in seven days, and that's pretty fast. And that can be adjustable based on a few things. If you're a, a customer who's been buying from us for five or six years, I know you're good for it. Right. I know your intent is there, even if your ability in the short term to pay may not be. But when we bring on somebody new, then what I really pay attention to is their intent to pay. How do you do that? You have to gauge it. It's a gut feel. Do you do credit checks or anything like that? You can that? do all the checks you want, but if I have a guy who's pretty new and he's constantly, and he's a little, he's a little delayed, but he's constantly checking in on me and saying, hey, Dominic, here's my situation. Uh, I have more work coming this week. I'm going to be busier. And once I, if I get some fuel, because nothing moves without me. If I don't give you the fuel, you really can't run. <laughs> That's true. Right? Now you can call someone else, but yeah, there yeah, actually yeah. is some brotherhood in the fuel business. Got it. Where people will actually say, hey, um, wh why, you, why do you want to buy from me? Mm. Um, it's a way different way of looking at it. Anyway, if, if someone's a little bit behind and they're communicating with me, I know their intent is good, even if their ability is not. But when someone is kind of just not taking my phone calls or they don't reach out to me and I start to question their intent or, and if they don't have the ability, then I just kind of shut them off. Yeah. I'd rather lose a quick 10 grand than a slow hundred. A hundred percent. So yeah. you usually would prefer a seven day net, net seven, but you'll let it extend past that based on the intent. Yeah. It's not that linear. Got it. Got it. Got it. When, when you, uh, when you, uh, kind of have these conversations, are there anything else that you look at when you bring in, when you're bringing on these new accounts? Um, aside from the, the intent, obviously, do you check credit? I know you said it doesn't matter, but do you do that at all? Uh, we take a credit form. We look at everything, but no, we don't really That's go. That's not really the, the reason why you'll accept them or reject them. No, we really look at the scope of their business. Um, I've been doing this long enough where I know who's good and who's bad. Right. Um, right now we're at a relatively, what I call risk off period in the market. So we're not going out and really asking for business at the same cadence that we were in 2021. Because mm. I know that the more credit risk I put on, uh, it's, it's not necessarily good. Yeah. Um, that said, if, you, if you're a truck fleet and you call me right now, I'm probably not going to sell you fuel because you're probably not paying the person you have. <laughs> That's right? true, unfortunately. And then you're just going to pay them with my money, and then I become a—, a it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like a non-secured line of credit issuer. Right, right. right? right. I'm in the fuel business. I'm not in the credit business, but yeah. these guys want to put me in the credit business. So I'll also pay attention to um, if what you're hauling, do you own the product? And if you own the product, it means you're making money on the freight and the product. 
if you're just moving other people's freight, you really have no control over your rates. What's an example of that? Uh, unfortunately, dump trucks, right? They're moving other people's dirt. They're moving other people's product. And in a high interest rate environment, they can get stretched out pretty quickly because the building developer hires out a subcontractor who hires out the dump truck as the end subcontractor to pull all the rubble or dirt away. So they can get paid last in a high interest rate environment and get really stretched out. Their intent may be good, but their ability might just not be there because of that stretch. So you really have to be careful um, with anybody, but dump trucks just as an example. Got it. Is there a max credit you'll extend somebody? If someone's new, I won't go past 10K. Past 10K? Yeah. Okay. If someone's been with me for a long time, that can go as high as it needs to go, and then we can just price it accordingly. Got it. Has there ever been a, 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 is there a reason why it's 10K? Has there ever been a, a time when somebody stiffed you where you let it get too far and yeah. you regretted it? Um, I had a client in 2018 who was a near and dear friend. He was a really nice guy and he had the intent to pay and he had me out for 120 grand and he wasn't even past due. That was three weeks of fuel. I mean, this guy was just drinking it. Yeah. And he had one of his, he was a dump truck guy and he had one of his like upstream vendors or upstream customers, the building developer could no longer pay anybody. They basically just stiffed the whole operation. Oh, wow. And this guy had come from overseas, built a really nice business, and his whole world changed. And I had a lot of empathy for the guy, but it took me three years to collect that money. And that's why I tell you I'd rather lose a quick 10 grand than a slow 100. Yeah. Because that slow 100 is just grueling to collect. Did you collect it from him? Yeah, we did. Okay. Um, he made good on it. I, I, I actually make a joke. I If I have to collect money, if I like the person, I'll make sure I eat first. <laughs> so I'm nicer. <laughs> got you. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Okay, cool. I mean, it, it sounds like that situation, it wasn't really, it wasn't intended. It was no, it was fortunate circumstances, right? Um, I've been stiffed by people who intended it, but for like 15, 20K. Mm. It is what it is. When it happens, what do you do? How do, you, how do you recover that? There's you nothing just you lose can do. It? There's, yeah, you just write it off. There's really nothing you, you can't can do. Put in, there's no kind of insurance or anything that covers you on, your, on, on the There field. is receivable insurance, okay. but guys like this probably wouldn't qualify for it. Um, and that just comes with experience. Like I see new people come into the fuel business and issue credit all over the world, and it's just like, hey, you're going to learn. Like You come in hot, and then you're going to just be real stretched out. But no, there, there's really no remedy for it. You can go through collections, but unfortunately, our justice system doesn't really care. Got it. Got it. You said you do fuel transport as well. You deliver fuel to other gas stations also? Correct. Tell me about that business. Yeah. Um, 2012, that business changed considerably. Before then, ExxonMobil basically owned the market. So they owned the sites, and then they would lease it out to the operators. And then they would hire a third-party transporter, TNR Oil, and they would deliver gasoline. We would deliver the gasoline, but it wasn't our product, right? We didn't own the product. Right. We just owned the trucks and did the it's freight. Exxon's. Yes. Product, right? Yep. Okay. And their locations. Yeah. In 2012, they opened the market up for bid. I was in college. I was a freshman. I was getting ready to go out. I was partying one night. My dad calls me and he says, hey, I have an opportunity to go take all the customers that I've been servicing for 20 years. What do you think? Should I do it? And I was like, yeah, man. Sounds like a great opportunity. I was a kid. But I was like, yeah, <laughs> sounds like a great idea. My dad went out and did it. And since he had all those relationships and the gas station operators were used to seeing his name on the truck. When he showed up, he was able to convert 30 gas stations to buy from him just by saying, hey, it's me. You already know me. You want to do a deal? And he actually brought me to a lot of the sales calls while I was home from college uh, that that December. So I got to meet a lot of his customers. And um, my dad always said, it's like, it's my dad loved bringing me because it showed continuity in a family business that there's someone coming after me uh, to, to, to help manage your account. Right. So fast forward. You're like Michael. He's the godfather. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, so fast forward eight years, uh, we still do that business. Um, it's, it's a great business. We don't own the trucks. We sub out all the transportation, and we're basically an ExxonMobil franchiser. Okay. So it's you just deliver to Exxon Mobiles? Or? Correct. No other gas stations. We have Sitgo as a brand as well, but we don't do much business with it. Um, but like, if if somebody had a Sunoco or an unbranded site and their contract term was ending, we have the rights to convert them to an Exxon Mobil if they'd like to. Okay. Is there a reason why you sub out all the trucks as opposed to having your own employees do it? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, running trucks is really expensive. Um, 
when you're hauling gasoline, it's a combustible, whereas diesel fuel is a flammable. So it's a little bit more dangerous to liability. operate. Yeah, yeah liability is higher. Um, and frankly, there are a cohort of folks who transport gas so cheaply, there's no reason to do it. They just want they just want to give it away, and for the rates they do it, I don't want to be in the business. Got it. And I don't know why they do it, but they do. So if someone wants to basically use their only service as a loss leader, we'll buy from you. Yeah, yeah. Is that a, is that a local Jersey thing, or is that like a national trend? I think that's just New Jersey. That's New Jersey. Yeah, they just do it for free. <laughs> I just I don't get it. That's why I do specialized services like the on-site fleet fueling, like where we show up every night. I have a shift that goes out now, 4.30 p.m., and we go to truck facilities while their trucks are parked. Yeah. And we'll fuel every truck individually. Right. And I can get paid because that's a service that I'm offering. It's hard to understand how you could, like, cut corners on that and, like, be so cheap. I mean, the, the equipment to, you know, the, the driver, you have to have hazmat. It's expensive, I, I would think. I can only speculate. Yeah. Okay. Maybe something else going on we don't know about. Yeah, like I said, I can, I can only speculate, man. I don't, I don't get it. Got it, got it, got it. So the guys who deliver for you guys, they, they have, they're independent owner-operators. They're doing their own thing, and they, you guys kind of make your margin off the top of that, and that's that. Yeah, we have a few of them, and then you know, we also make money on the product. Not much because it's, a, it's really a, a, a really margin-slim business. It's really a volume business. Yeah. Um, so we don't make much per load, but it's just something that you can do. Would you always just stay with Exxon only, or would you ever branch out and do any others? We've been with Exxon for 85 years. Yeah, there's no reason to. There's, yeah, I mean, they have a good brand. Um, it's nationally known. They have a good image. Uh, yeah, it's, there's really no reason to leave. Is there, was there anything better about Exxon Gas than anybody else's? Or their fuel, their diesel? What, what's the difference? So let's start with the diesel fuel. Absolutely. And this is something that I'm actually pretty impressed ExxonMobil did. They put out what's called diesel synergy sorry mobile diesel efficient and it's their pro, it's their proprietary product that has a fuel detergent in it okay now you can get detergents in my store you can get detergents ev- anywhere and you can pour it into your own product into your diesel into your own saddle tank and it'll kind of work what exxon mobile does better is they actually have it mixed at the rack when my trucks pick it up so mm. it's injected every so often into the load as it's being splashed into the truck. Okay. And the way it mixes actually makes it work better. Whereas when you pour that into your saddle tank, it just sits on top and doesn't get a proper mix. So the detergent's actually harming, not doing anything productive. ExxonMobil is the only company that does that at the rack. So that's pretty impressive. So okay. I can say with great confidence, their diesel is better. It guarantees a 2% better fuel burn and if a company like ExxonMobil is putting numbers on it, you bet they checked. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. It's probably 3%. Oh, for sure, right? for sure. Because somebody will come back and be like, hey, buddy, no, we're going to sue you for this or whatever. Okay, got you. Got so you. they really did their work. Yeah. Um, no doubt about it. And then as far as the gasoline goes, um, the gas is better. It does have detergents in it. But what really makes branded gasolines better than unbranded gasolines is branded such as like a BP, Sunoco, Exxon, Amico, uh, they use no butane or less butane content in their gasoline. So it has a lower flash point. Okay. So if you use unbranded gas once in a while, you're going to be fine. Your engine's just going to run at a slightly higher temperature. Got it. Can Where, you explain the butane thing? Because I'm not, I'm, I don't know. It's just cheaper. It's just butane. Yeah, it's like is lighter just, fluid. Got it. <laughs> yeah, but it's cheaper. So... Okay. Yeah, okay. but it, it burns hotter, burns faster. Okay, got it. How regulated is your industry? Like, in terms of compliance, what type of things do you have to do in order to keep this business running? Yeah, so, I mean, it's a hazmat business. Um, everybody has to have hazmat. Everybody has to have a TWIC card to load at the port. Um, safety is the absolute most important thing. Uh, I purposefully don't run a huge business. I like the size it is. We run an eight-truck operation. It's very manageable. I know every driver, like intimately. I can know their, I know all their story, their family, where they came from, what's going on, because um, it's small. So you really have to know your driver in in the business that I'm in, um, because safety is so important. We do the compliance, we do driver testing, we we send them like quizzes about driver training. We do a quarterly driver meeting. Um, we're all we're just all over it. You have to be all over it. 
Uh, the truck maintenance needs to be absolutely top notch. Everything is addressed basically same day when a driver writes it up. It needs to be, but it actually is here. Um, and that makes it easier to hire drivers because we have a lot of folks who come and they don't like the condition of their current, their current company, how they keep the trucks. So the fact that we do that and we do it on site and they see us doing it because we have somebody come between shifts and change oil, look at lubricant levels, look at antifreeze. Um, so compliance is important, but maintenance is right there with it. Mm, got it. Um, running these multiple business, I could imagine like your P&L must be like a nightmare because you have so much cash flow coming in and out from different places. How do you stay on top of that as a business owner? What, what, what does that look like? In, like running these different operations that are all different? <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're all operated separately. So TNR is separate than Tula Truck Stop, which is separate than Bridgeview Investors, which is the land. Um, so we're, we're able to kind of get a pulse of where each business is at just by kind of looking at a, a, a balance sheet. Um, admittedly, I'm not super involved in the finance side. That's mostly my brother, Alex, mm. but we have our finger on the pulse of it pretty well, but that's because they're all separate. If they were all put together, it would be impossible. For sure. For yeah. sure. What part of the business do you, do you enjoy the most? Oh, um, I think I enjoy, I enjoy the f fuel the most just knowing the customers and talking to my customers and hearing like their the stories. Like the national sales? Or no, the local guys. The local guys. Yeah, I okay. really like my local customers the most. That's probably my favorite part. Okay. Because they become, they kind of become friends. Like one of the nicest part about my business is I sell to truck fleets. I'm not a truck fleet that sells to mom and pop businesses that have no idea of what happens in the trucking company. Right. So when I get on the phone with a customer there's a lot of mutual sympathy for what everyone's going through. If I say, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I had a truck breakdown last night. And we just couldn't get the job done properly. They're like, yeah, bro, I get it. Like, so I, I have that kind of, there's kind of a brotherhood with, between me and my customers of like, a, hey, I, I understand what you're going through. Now that said, like, I pick my customers. So if I have someone who's just a nightmare to deal with, I won't deal with it. Mm. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, hey, thanks, sorry, but we're not servicing you anymore. So I like that business because I'm, I'm, it's, it's the right size and I have the right customers and, and that's fun. Um, but the real estate is, is really the bread and butter. Got it. Actually owning the property, having the people rent and so forth. Correct. The tenants. Okay. Got it. With your, with your local accounts, um, how do you, how do you, are you still actively selling or is it more like word of mouth? Like how are you getting these local accounts? Now? Sure. So there's a mixed approach. We do have some SEO on our website. And that's really nice because you can throttle it up and down. Um, but it brings in a different kind of customer than when we're going out selling directly. It brings in customers who literally go to Google and search fuel near me. That's a way different customer than the 10 truck fuel, I'm sorry, the 10 truck uh, company operator. Those guys we go out directly to, um, our trucks are all plastered with too low and our website and our phone number. So that's a walking billboard. We take advantage of that as well. Yeah. Um, a lot of word of mouth, a whole lot of word of mouth. I would say 75% of it's word of mouth. Just saying, Hey, I use TNR. They do good by me. Um, they're in the same yard. A lot of these guys share yards. So it's like, Hey, I use TNR and you just moved in. You should just use TNR, whether that be for fuel or DEF. Um, and then I'm very active on Twitter. I'm not sure if that really grows our business in a direct way. But it's really helped me kind of meet people in a, in a greater realm. And um, I think eventually that will lead to business. Got it. How much does a fleet s save by doing the on-site fueling? Do you have any like numbers or, around that? I sure do. If you run 30 trucks and you need to have all of those trucks fuel daily five times a week, and you have to have them fuel daily if they're running anywhere reasonably far, and they all go to a truck stop, when you rack up the labor you're paying them, your insurance, your truck costs, it'll cost you $175,000 per year to send 30 trucks to a truck stop in time loss. Hmm. That doesn't even include the opportunity cost of what you're not making because they're not delivering anything. That's right. Right. They're sitting there for an hour in a fuel station. Correct. So if it's going to cost you 175 k we will charge you considerably less than that for our service. And hmm. that's the arbitrage. That's our margin. So if it's going to cost you 50 to use me, but you're going to save 120 grand, that's where I fit in. 
Got it. Got it. What's the objections typically that that when you're selling, somebody will say, well, we don't want to do it because of this. Yeah, I've had customers who will say, hey, Dominic, you're more or you're the same than what I can pay at a local truck stop. If that's your mentality, my service is not for you. I cannot convince you of math (laughs) if you don't want to be convinced. So that's how we look at it. And I'll I'll take them through the formula and say, this is how it is. And, And if this doesn't work for you, then that's fine. Um, I've also had large trucking fleets say, well, Dominic, why don't I just get my own fuel truck and do it myself? You should, (laughs) but you're not. And it's easier to just say yes to me. So it, it just depends. Yeah. yeah, yeah, But I can't convince somebody in math, bro. Right. For for sure. How do you do that? How often are you out there selling? Like, is it like once a week? Is it like once a month? Like what's your cadence? Yeah. Right now, like I said, I'm pretty risk off, but I have a sales rep named Tom Campbell. Okay. Who's just an absolute killer. And he's out there uh, every single day. But right now we're mostly maintaining the customers we have. Got it. And then when someone juicy comes along, we'll, (laughs) we'll put them on. But if it's something that's just too risky right now, we're just not taking it. What does Juicy look like? Juicy's like an 80 truck unicorn, man. <laughs> like we go there and we can spend four or five hours on site taking our time, offering good service. It's really a gallons per hour business. So if I can build critical mass at one facility and spend time there and do 2,000 gallons directly, you know, and not spend five or six hours on a route driving, that's got lower gallons per minute. Those, those types of customers are unicorns, and they're, they're very hard to get. But if you can get one, we will just service the hell out of it. And the way we do that and the way we do it differently is I put one guy on a truck, and my trucks actually have a traditional diesel nozzle. My competitors put two folks on a truck. They have a thicker hose, and they use a swivel. And the swivel has no automatic shutoff, but it pumps like three times the speed. That's great. But when you spill diesel all over the back of this guy's new Peterbilt, (laughs) that's not a phone call you want to get the next day. For sure. So I teach teach our guys, hey, you're really a customer service representative who's going to basically be a service tech and go spend the time on site diligently, fill every single truck, put every single cap on the right way. Because if you don't and they spill diesel in the port, it's going to cost that poor guy 10 grand. That's right. Right. So it's a issue, boy. That's big. That's big. Yeah. So it's just, just, just kind of knowing where we fit into the market and just doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. How has the overall industry volatility impacted you guys as a business? It's a really good question. Um, the volatility doesn't necessarily affect us from a profitability perspective. We do the same margins, whether price is high or price is low. My price changes every night at 7 p.m. And we'll just move with it based on a fixed markup over that cost. Where it gets tricky is when the costs are high like they are now, I have to go more risk off because my receivables are higher. So if I'm doing, if I normally would have a million dollar account receivable, Right now I may have three, but I'm not making any more money because the price is high, right? Mm. But when the barrel went, like, went to zero during COVID, that was great. I could go crazy because my exposure was way lower per gallon. So that's really the only difference. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then moving into the future, what, I mean, you guys already are juggling a bunch of businesses. Is there anything that you guys are bullish on or that you're thinking about in terms of expansion? What, what, what's on the horizon? Yeah. Um, separately from my family business, um, just something that I'm working on um, with a co-founder is actually a social media agency for freight adjacent brands. Okay. And this is actually the first podcast that I'm ever talking about it on. Okay. Um, it's called Stealth Mode Media, and it is a Twitter agency. And we're focusing on Twitter and basically building freight adjacent brand followings on Twitter. What made I, you want to do that? About a year ago, I met my co-founder, Reed Laustalo, and I actually reached out to him on Twitter. He had like no followers at the time, but I saw he was just really active and talking about freight. I started digging more into just freight in general on Twitter, and I just started talking about freight, fuel, and how much money you can save on using on-site fueling. And that simple equation that I spelt out to you, it did 50,000 impressions. I was like, hmm, I'm on something here. Yeah. Okay. Fast forward about a year, Reed and I just knew that there is money to be made by growing brands' presence on Twitter. And it's like, 
It just hasn't happened yet. Now, when I started here in 2015, frankly, like from a social media perspective, it's lonely. There's really nobody on social media talking about what I'm doing. I'm not necessarily around people who are freight adjacent. They just happen to work at a a logistics company. And online communities, which I've really seen blossom in the last year, are giving me a space to learn about different parts of the business and meet like-minded folks my age who are younger who will be the future running these freight businesses. And they're on social media. For sure. And I want to get ahead of that. Mm. Mm. I love that, man. And, and it's a, a huge pivot for you, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's right. a huge pivot. Um, we've got some really, really good content creators on the back end. Um, and right now we're just scaling out, taking any freight account that is interested and understands the long-term vision of being there before the gold rush happens. And I think it's important to understand that branding's changed. It's not all about having a call to action on every single time you touch the customer or touch social media. It's about growing a community or a brand and having some entertaining content and some lighthearted content mixed in with serious content. And that's something that we specialize in. Right. No, I love that. And especially the fact that you're actually in the business, right? A lot of times you have creators that aren't actually operators, right? But you're an operator and creator, so it, it adds validity and to, to you know your messaging, right? So I mean, I think that's really cool. Yeah, it's oh. super exciting. I actually think it'll be the biggest thing I ever work on. Okay, okay. Well, that's amazing, man. Uh, in terms of the family business, any types of insp- expansion or ideas around that are still kind of you know, just doubling down on what you guys are already doing and just continuing to grow there. At these times in the market, we really want to pay attention to how good our operation is. Is everything delegated and operated as well as it could be? A business gets the results that it's designed to get. So if your business is getting mediocre results, that's how your business is designed. And I just want to step back and be really sober about, is our business getting the best results that it can? And the answer is always no. Mm -hmm. But I want to really hone in on that. So in the next year, we're going to be focusing on improving our technology stack even more, uh, making sure that we're getting the right margins out, not by increasing rates, just by lowering our expenses. So really paying attention to where we can save money is the near-term future for TNR Oil um, and the rest of the businesses. Um, Looking out further term, it'll just be growing out diesel business, maybe having a larger footprint. I'm very bullish on the next 20 years of diesel fuel. I don't think we're going to see any major energy changes um, in the next 20 years on the type of customers that we service. So growing out the diesel business slowly and methodically and just having a really nice 15-truck diesel business would be really nice in the next five years. Got it. What do you do to keep yourself um, in terms of personal development, keep yourself ahead of the curve and sharp? What, do, are you reading anything? What, what do you look to for news Talk to me about that. Yeah, I, I'm reading always. I'm, I'm listening to stuff always. I, I have a joke with myself that the reason why I know the things I know is because what I listen to is so boring. <laughs> Anybody who gets in the car with me, could, like, it's just like, why, why would you listen to this, right? right? So I'm just listening to stuff. Like I'm listening to podcasts. Give me an example of some of that boring uh, the, stuff. The All In to. podcast is all actually in. not boring, I but that. I really like Shemoth that one. and those guys. Oh, my yep. God. Yeah, sometimes I hear some of the stuff they're talking about, and I'm like, man, I does anyone realize how lucky we are that this is free, <laughs> that these guys are sharing their minds for free? Yeah. Um, Chris Powers' podcast, it's a little bit more real estate specific. He's okay. in Dallas, Fort Worth, um, but he's talking about all stuff, industrial real estate and just real estate in general. Um, and then my wife and I run a side hustle where we actually buy in, uh, short-term rental houses. Okay. Um, so I've been learning a little bit about that through podcasts. Airbnb? And, yeah, Airbnb. Um, I learn a lot on Twitter, just who I follow on Twitter and reading and um the cool thing about Twitter is you can engage with the people that you look up to. So Craig Fuller on, on, on freight waves, like I can engage with him. He answers like, and that's a guy that I heard on the pomp podcast two years ago. And I was like, bro, this guy is playing at a different level. Yeah, sharp. Right. Um, and then in addition to that, I, I, um, just a lot of exercise and just kind of give myself a break at night and kind of separate. I, I really do have a good work life balance. I love it. I love it. Are you married? I am. Okay. Yeah. My How wife, long? Madeline and I are married about a year. Well, okay. Actually, over a year. You're a newlywed. Yeah. Okay. How old are you? I'm 30. 30? Okay. Newlywed, 30. You living a life, man. Yeah, it's great. 
<laughs> Life's been good to me, man. That's a beautiful thing. All right, cool. So as we wrap, um, you know, traditionally on the show, we always have a final thought, which is something you want to leave the audience with, you know, entrepreneurial, gem, spiritual, wherever you want to go with it, and then let people know where they connect with you. I mean, you're getting into social media, so that's very important on this podcast because a bunch of people are going to hit you up, I'm sure, after they hear this. So um, first, where can people connect with you and learn more? Uh, I'm most active on Twitter. I am Dominic underscore Tulo. I will respond to anybody. I'll talk to anybody about anything. Uh, but yeah, most active on Twitter. Always on there. Got it. And then the final thought, what do you want to leave the audience with? Just get started. Whatever you want to do, just get started. If you're in your job and you don't like it, just get started doing something else. I, just just do it. Just motion. Poetry in motion. You got to keep it moving. You keep it moving, you get results. I love it. If you don't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. Hustle fam, you know what we do around this time. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire. I'm here with my man, Dominic Tulo. Man, this is a good one, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for, uh, for having me. Thank you for coming out. Hustle fam, we are out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.